This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Church Street United Methodist Church proudly presents Rejoice. Well, good morning and welcome to Rejoice. I'm delighted that we can share this time remembering the goodness of God and seeking strength for our daily living. I'm Richard Looney, one of the pastors of the Church Street United Methodist Church. And in a moment, we will be reading from the third chapter of Colossians. I invite you to have your Bible ready for the reading. In the meantime, we will hear from the parish youth choir singing to sing to the Lord a new song. The third chapter of Colossians is a fascinating bit of advice for those of us who claim to be followers of Christ. In a few moments, we will read from the 18th verse to the end of the chapter, but I'd like to talk just a minute about the theme of Colossians 3. Paul is dealing with the fact that in Christ we become new creatures. We're not only forgiven of our sins, but we're enabled to lead a different life, a new life. And he, he uses some very vivid uh, phrases to describe that. He says, we are buried with Christ, and then we are raised with Christ. As Christ suffered death on the cross and was crucified, dead, and buried, so we give up our old life and become a new creation. And as Christ was resurrected, we have the possibility of becoming new persons in Christ. To describe what this ought to be like, Paul uses some very graphic phrases. He said, we are to put off the old life like a dirty garment, put off fornication, impurity, passion, evil desire, greed, wrath, malice, slander, abusive language, 
and lying. Then he said, we are to clothe ourselves or put on compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. We're to bear with each other. We're to, be, to forgive as we've been forgiven. And above everything else, we are to clothe ourselves in love. We're going to be thinking in a few moments about Labor Day, the fact that we honor those who labor and produce the good of this country. But we're also going to be asking, how is it that our own work can have new meaning and new purpose? Paul goes on to describe how the Christian will live as a husband or as a wife. He describes the way children should treat their parents and parents should treat uh, their children. And then he moves to a consideration of how a slave should work under a master. Beginning at the 22nd verse, he said, Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything, not only while being watched in order to please them, but wholeheartedly fearing the Lord. Whatever your task, put yourselves into it as done to the Lord. Sometimes those of us who work feel like slaves. So in a real sense, uh, this is a good reminder of how we are to do our daily work, how we are to relate to our supervisor, and how we are to honor God in everything we do. In 1894, the Congress of the United States unanimously established Labor Day as a national holiday. Understanding that those who worked hard with their hands and long hours deserved credit for the greatness of this country. In 1909, they declared uh, Labor Sunday. And now more than 80 countries around the world recognize May Day as a time to honor the international worker. I have a peculiar affinity for the working class, for those who work with their hands, who end the day with tired backs. I grew up on a farm in uh, the southwest Virginia, a mountain farm. I know what it is to plow and to plant and hoe and harvest. I know what it is to bring in the hay before the rain falls in the evening. I know what it is to have callous hands. And then uh, in preparing for, for college, I worked several summers as a common laborer. Twice I worked as a, a clerk in a company store in Virginia and, and West Virginia. I learned how to bag groceries, uh, how to wait on customers, how to ring up sales, and how to be nice when people weren't always nice to you. I learned what it's like to work after hours to unload a boxcar full of flour. I knew what it was to be bone tired and, and exhausted. Uh, later, I, I worked as a ditch digger for the water company in a West Virginia town. It was on the river, very humid, 103 degrees some days. And we didn't have ditch diggers then. We had a pick and a shovel. And we worked long hours because we had to lay the pipe and then we had to cover it so nobody would fall in overnight. And then we started again the next day. Uh, you didn't stop after eight hours or 10 hours or maybe 12 hours. You finished when you finished. The wages were low and nobody heard of overtime at that time. So I, I have a special affinity for those who, who work. I understand uh, what they go through, et cetera. And I, I wonder how often we think about those who toil in the heat of the sun, who do those regular tasks day by day. So this is a time to salute those who work with their hands, who keep commerce moving, who keep our infrastructure in order, and we honor them. But it's also a time to ask how we might honor God with our work uh, whatever it might be. It's good to remember that Jesus worked until he was 30 as a carpenter. 
He knew what it was to toil with his hands. Somebody said Jesus even had dirt under his fingernails. And that's good to know that as we take labor and work, that someone understands what we've been through. There are interesting ways of uh, looking at work. Uh, some people see work only as a necessary evil. It's uh, something we do to earn a living. And it is important to earn a living. We need to feed our families. We need to care for our needs. But if we're only doing it for the reward, the immediate reward, it can become dull and routine. One of the ways this happens is that if we're only thinking about uh, the money, we can always be unhappy because we can think of somebody who's making more or somebody who's uh, better off than we are. And we can be envious that we aren't doing better. When I was still an active bishop, I remember one day visiting with a, with a pastor who uh, came to show me how he had been mistreated by the system. He showed me the number of uh, pastors that he had graduated with who were above him. And as we talked, I said, well, I've noticed something interesting. You didn't talk about the pastors who were beneath you in salary. We tend just to always look for somebody for which to be envious. So then our work just becomes something we go through. We're not fulfilled in it. We just do what we have to do to get our check. And that can become, after a period of time, very tiring and boring and debilitating. We need to see more in our work than just earning a paycheck. And if it's just a, a paycheck, we can uh, find ourselves in the position of abusing other people of taking advantage of other people. For the last uh, year or so, we've been in a conversation politically in this country about the 1% and the 99%. And we've uh, talked a lot about the spreading gap between the very rich and the, the laboring persons. If we become obsessed with where we stand, we will lose the meaning of what we do and how we do it. So I would hope your work, maybe even your retirement, some of you who are listening are, are retired. And how do you see your retirement? Is it just to do what you want to do? Is it just to be comfortable? Or is it an opportunity to honor God and to do something significant in the life of our community? Then on, on the even worse side, some of us see work just as a curse. We remember the story of the Garden of Eden. You remember Adam and Eve and how they uh, sinned and then were cursed with labor. What we forget is that they were commissioned to look after the garden before the fall. And then it was a joy and a, and a treat and not a curse. It's uh, f fascinating to see how we look at our work sometimes. Well, when I was here several years ago doing Rejoice, Going to the studio every week and recording a 20-minute sermon became a real chore. I dreaded it every week. Got to get it in mind, got to look at the camera, got to try to imagine that somebody's listening, and I just dreaded going. And one day, the person at the studio said, do you know how many people watch this program? I said, no, I have no idea. Well, he told me several thousand. And suddenly, I started looking forward to the taping time. It was not just to tape, it was to communicate the gospel, to share the good news, and to do it with thousands of people. And sometimes uh, we forget what we do and the effect it has on human life and the human family. So let me, let me suggest several ways that we can find new meaning in our work, even in our retirement. Paul says, uh, do it for the Lord. He says in another place, remember that you are a co-laborer with God. I don't know about you, but I always enjoy working better with somebody. I can remember on the farm how bored I got hoeing corn by myself. 
But when my dad and I did it together, he was a big tease and he carried on and made jokes about how slow I was and so forth. And it's amazing. The work is finished quickly and easily when you're doing it with somebody. Several years ago, I was trying to get back in shape and I had become a jogger and it was killing me. If I did a mile, it was just about all I could do. And I started running with some friends who would talk with me and joke with me. And the first time they uh, ran with me and got my mind off how miserable I was, I finally realized I needed to stop. And they said, you know how long you run? And I said, oh, maybe a mile. They said, three miles. And I said, amazing. You see, when you're thinking about yourself, you're struggling when you're enjoying the company of others, you find exhilaration and adventure. Well, suppose we were doing our work for God. Suppose we were trying to honor God in what we do. It would make all the difference in the world. A Methodist preacher was in a, in a Catholic hospital and he was complimenting the nurse who'd cared for him so carefully. And he said, I thank you for the way you've looked after me. She said, oh, uh, I'm not doing it for you. I'm doing it for God. And I've learned over the years that if I can see people, some who are hard to get along with, some who are unpleasant, if I can see them as children of God and try to be open to them and loving with them as a brother or sister in Christ, it makes all the difference in the world. Somebody was complaining one day and they said, uh, oh, I work like a slave. And their friend said, well, uh, you could work like a queen. And wouldn't it be amazing to do our work in a way to honor God? When I was still an active bishop, uh, one of the things that gave me the greatest difficulty was the telephone. Uh, you wouldn't believe the number of calls that a bishop receives from lay people complaining about something and uh, most of them weren't happy when they called. And I'd come to the place that I dreaded the phone. And one day I, I had an interesting insight. I said, uh, why don't you see this phone call as a way to be useful? So when the phone rang, instead of picking it up immediately, which I usually did, I would just simply pray, Lord, help me to be useful in this telephone call. Well, that simple prayer, that simple reminder made a complete difference in the way I answered the phone. Here was not just an unhappy soul, but here was a brother or sister that I might be able to give encouragement to or might be able to help in their frustration and grief. So I hope as you do your work or you live your life, you'll remember that you're not alone, that you're in the presence of the living God and you can do your work for God's glory. The second thing we can do to make our work meaningful or our retirement meaningful is to think about the good our work or our time can accomplish. I uh, mentioned that I had dug ditches one summer with a pick and shovel. Uh, there was an old man on the job who was slower than any of us, but he just kept at it. And at the end of the day, he had done more than uh, any of us, even we young squirts. And during this time, I, I heard a wonderful little uh, prayer from a ditch digger. He said, I can dig a ditch so straight and true that God himself can see it through. Not only did he remember the good being done by the ditch, but he remembered that God was overlooking what he was doing and it made all the difference in his life and in his work. I heard a story several years ago about a, a crew of uh, five men who were out and, and their supervisors would go along and say, uh, dig here. And they would dig down about 18 inches and he'd come and look and say, fill it up. So then he'd say, dig here, and they'd uh, dig down 18 inches, and then he'd say, fill it up. Well, this went on for several hours, and finally they just threw their picks and shovels down and said, we don't mind working, but we're not going to be made a fool out of. 
and we quit before we'll just do this senseless work. He laughed and said, oh, I'm sorry. He said, I, I should have told you what we're doing. He said, there's a leak in a, in a water line. And said, we're trying to find the leak. And if you go down 18 inches and there's no moisture, we know that's not where the leak is. So we move on to a different spot. So they smiled and said, oh, uh, that's different. So uh, they picked up their tools and uh, went back to work. I wonder how many of us remember whether we're driving a truck, whether we're a clerk in a store, whether we're digging a ditch, if we remember the good we're doing. This ditch I was digging was to contain a six inch water line and it was to carry pure water from one part of town to an outskirts of town. And when we remembered that, it made the hot day uh, less so. So remember the good that you're doing. Remember the opportunities you have for service. And then remember that meaning can be found in work when you give your best. We all are geared to do well. And if we just walk through or go through the motions, it becomes very meaningless. I remember one summer working as a clerk, the miners were on vacation. So nobody came into the store, but our boss had a, a caged office, not a caged office, a glass office right in the middle of the store. And he expected us to stay busy when there was nothing to do. So we would restock if one can was sold or we would dust where we'd already dusted. And those were the longest eight hours I ever remember trying to act busy when we were not busy. We need to find ways to give our best. God gave us all talents and we can develop those talents wherever we are. And then finally, we can uh, learn to relate to the people where we work. Don't become so obsessed with your job that you forget so-and-so who may have a broken heart, who may be carrying a heavy burden, and see what ways you can be useful in reaching out to that person. You remember what Paul said, you are a new creation in Christ, and at work, at home, wherever you are, you are to show tenderness and compassion and put off malice, etc. In closing, we need to remember that while we were called to work, we are not to work incessantly. God rested on the seventh day. And Jesus made it very clear that we are to rest, to be renewed, to remember who we are. And if we work incessantly, we will burn out and we won't be as effective. I love the stories of those old wagon trains going west. There was one train that had a very religious leader and every Sabbath they stopped. They rested the, the mules or the horses, they rested themselves. Another caravan had a hard driving boss who didn't believe in rest. He wanted to drive on day after day after day. Would you believe the wagon train that rested every seventh day arrive well ahead of the driven one. And sometimes we can so order our life that we abuse our life and burn out our life. So Jesus reminded us, as do the commandments, to keep the Sabbath and to honor the Sabbath and keep it holy. We honor today those people who work hard that we might have food and transportation and life and we talk, take a moment to look at our own life to see if we honor God, to see if we serve humanity, and to see if we make a difference in the world where we sing, where we live. And now will you be prayerfully attuned as the youth choir sings, all things work together for good.
Thank you again for joining me for Rejoice. As you live your life this week, I hope you will reach out in a special way to someone who waits on you. Express appreciation. Remember their long hours and difficult tasks and the way some of them are struggling to have enough to eat and to take care of their families. And then as you do your work and as you uh, seek to honor God in your retirement, I hope you will remember that whatever you do, you're in the presence of the living God. You are a new creation. You can lead new life and be a new person. And I hope you will do something that will make a difference in somebody else's life. May God bless us all as we seek to be what God intends us to be. This is the day the Lord has made. Members and friends of Church Street United Methodist Church, your downtown church at the corner of Henley and Main, would like to thank you for joining Rejoice. Please send us your comments and suggestions, and be sure to tune in next Sunday at this same time for Rejoice. <laughs>